Hi ladies. I am here in my home, snowed in once again. I'm sure you're experiencing some of the same. Uh, so let's talk about what's coming up and this week's reading. First of all, I sent you all a couple of emails um, in the last two days, one of which was to clarify for the reading task that's due this Friday that uh, there's a list of religious orders that I want you to consider researching. Please pick one of the orders on the list. Make sure you don't do Islam and you don't do Eastern Orthodoxy. Those are different religions, not religious orders within the Catholic Christian tradition. Also, I sent you a second email with the wording that's in the syllabus about the research paper that you're going to write. The paper is not due till April 5th, but you do, um, not this week, but next week, so Friday, March 1st, you do have an outline of this paper due. Uh, I had said this before in a previous um, video, but the outline would be a keyword outline. It would basically uh, mention the main points and try to be fairly detailed if you can. And if you have an A, there should be a B. If you have a 1, there should be a 2. Those are some basic outline rules. I did post some sample outlines on the module for the week that this is due, which is not this coming week, but the week after. And um, obviously that means you need to pick a topic. Uh, again, the topic has to be about a woman, an important woman in the history of the church, Catholic church or Christian. Uh, please don't pick a biblical woman and try to pick someone who's been mentioned in the book and maybe a simple look at the index of the book would help you. So you have an outline due on March 1st. I think the outline would be at least a page. And again, it doesn't have to be sentences, but just keywords. Uh, you will take the midterm by March 8th, and the works cited page for that paper is due March 22nd, and then again, the paper is actually due on April 5th. So you'll do an outline first, a works cited, and then the actual paper. So as far as the reading for this week, uh, let me pull that up. So there's a lot of uh, different topics. You're going to read three different chapters, chapter 11, 12, and 13. And the first thing it's going to talk about is basically the eastern half of the Roman Empire. Um, this was considered one whole organization and one church within it. But as you'll see in the reading, a lot of things kind of developed as sort of conflicts between the western part of the church and the eastern part of the church. And one thing in the time that you're reading about, um, there's a lot of barbarian invasions. And so when the barbarians invaded, they basically um, made it very difficult politically. There was a lot of political upheaval. And so whenever there was a lot of unrest politically, the church became a lot stronger. And whenever there was a lot of um, stability for the government, then the church was weaker. And that's what we basically see happen between the West and the East. In the West, there's a lot of political upheaval, but there's a very strong church. And there's a much more um, obvious division between the two. And then in the East, because the government is more stable, the church and the government are almost seen as one thing. Um, they call this Caesaropapism, but when the emperor has kind of control over the church or is kind of the, um, the head person in that church, okay? Um, in the West, they definitely saw the pope as the head of the church, the emperor as a separate entity, and the two weren't as connected, but in the East, they were totally connected. Um, so you're going to read about some of the emperors in the East, and their attempts at unifying the two groups, uh, but that didn't really succeed. Justinian was the emperor who tried to do that. And then there's a lot of kind of conflict. Some of that conflict, um, the people in the East really referred to themselves as the Orthodox Church, which means the right opinion. And in their opinion, of course, what they were thinking was right. So in the East, um, their masses were said in Greek, whereas in the West it was in Latin. They had a different kind of idea of the Trinity in the East than they do in the West. Um, they obviously saw that the church and state should be united in the East, where in the West they tried to keep that divided. Um, their, you know, the church councils seemed to be so, sort of divinely inspired, and so what they got from those councils varied a little bit. And how they worshipped was different. In particular, they had an issue with the wording in the West, about the Holy Spirit. And you'll read about kind of their difference in worship. Um, one thing that was a big deal was icons versus religious art. In the East, they saw icons as um, 
something that you would pray on that would add to your spirituality. And an icon was simply a picture of a person. It wasn't usually a picture of an event. It didn't have much going on in the background. Um, when you looked at it, you would focus on that person and their role in the church. So if you go to an Eastern Orthodox church, you're going to see on their altar this big, giant, beautiful icon screen. And they really um, re reflect on those icons. In the Western part of the church, they had much more elaborate religious art that depicted moments in history that were very realistic. And so in the East, they saw those as being distracting. Uh, there's so much going on in the artwork, the, all these statues and stuff. And so this became known as the iconoclast controversy. In the East, the only kind of artwork that they um, saw as important were icons. And then they got rid of everything else. And in the West, they believed that all the religious art really mediated this relationship with God. Um, in the next chapter, you're going to talk about Islam and the rise of Islam. And just a little bit about that. Uh, this all started with Muhammad, who was a caravan driver in Mecca. Very simple guy. And at the end of the workday, he would go into a cave to kind of meditate. And there he was visited by Angel Gabriel, or I think as the uh, Muslims refer to him, is Jibril. And Gabriel uh, spoke to Muhammad and gave him all these different visions. Muhammad was illiterate, couldn't read or write, so he had to memorize everything that Jibril said. And he memorized it all, told someone else. It was finally written down into what's known as the Quran. And um, there's a lot of kind of comparisons or th similarities between Islam and Christianity. They're monotheistic. In Islam, they pray to Allah, but that's simply an Arabic word for God. So they're praying to God. Um, they see Muhammad as being an important prophet, just like they recognize Jesus as an important prophet. Um, so Islam really started to develop there, and it was um, really kind of spread from the east going west. Uh, they really believed that they needed to convert everyone, and they did this somewhat forcefully at times. So there were lots of battles, um, and the battles included the Crusades, which I'll talk about in a moment. You'll read about the five pillars of Islam, which are their five main big beliefs and practices. This is basically one being a profession of faith, two, uh, praying five times a day facing Mecca, three, giving 2.5% of their wealth to the church, four, uh, this would be fasting during the month of Ramadan, and then five, at the end of Ramadan, one time in their life, they're supposed to make a religious pilgrimage to Mecca, which is called the Hajj. Uh, but anyway, because they were kind of marching from east to west, and in the Christian church, they're fending them off, and they finally stopped them near France um, in the Battle of Tours. Uh, but anyway, uh, one thing that happened when they kind of took over a bunch of land is they kind of closed off the passageway that people had to get to the Promised Land or to get to Jerusalem. And this was um, still, for Christians, a place that you would make a holy pilgrimage. And so this really uh, caused a lot of conflict. So after the East kind of asked the West to work together, um, and just mind you, this was 50 years after what's known as the Great Schism. The Great Schism is when there was an official split between the Western Church and the Eastern Church. But then 50 years later, they band together to fight off the Muslims in what's known as the Crusades. Uh, there were lots of different Crusades. Uh, the, four, the first four were the most... Uh, participated in with the biggest armies and the first crusade called all of these different like w workers in the fields and stuff to become crusaders and to go fight for the holy land so it started off with a good cause pope urban ii was the pope at the time calling for the crusaders and actually the first crusade was successful we were able to open the routes to the holy land and for us to take over the holy land for a short time but all of the rest of the Crusades were basically events where a lot of people were killed and where we were unsuccessful at gaining control of the Holy Land. And um, it started to become about these great military leaders and waging these battles, but mostly they were trying to gain personal wealth and stealing from churches and raiding their uh, valuables and their priceless pieces of art. And then that would go into the pockets of the Crusaders instead of trying to get back the Holy Land. Um, then the last chapter is about monasticism and kind of the developments with monasticism. And Western monasticism kind of developed thanks to John Cashin. 
and St. Benedict. And so St. Benedict wrote a rule. Before this, in the monasteries, they were practicing a lot of really um, self-harm. They weren't sleeping at all. They weren't eating at all. They were hurting themselves. Um, and they were doing all of this to understand the suffering of Christ. And then along came St. Benedict, who um, preached a new rule or order. And basically, his rule was called the middle way, where there was all of those things I just mentioned, but in more moderation. They would still not sleep as much, not eat as much, and spend most of their time in prayer and study. Um, the Middle Ages and the monasteries got a little hazy because of the feudal system. When um, monks started a monastery, they became vassals to the Lord, and whoever the Lord was might expect them to contribute soldiers for battle, and they had to work land, so that means they had to employ like serfs who would work the land for them. Um, and they became kind of the largest landowner, but also the slaveholder. And that wasn't ideal. Also in this time, it was common for the emperors to appoint the bishops until this one monastery in Cluny opened. And this monastery made it a rule that they would appoint their own bishops, their own leadership. And also they put an end to um, like the selling of religious goods and um, Lay investiture, again, is when the emperor is appointing the bishops. They put an end to that. And um, so that was a good move. And you'll see, also, you'll read about two different popes, both named Pope Gregory, Gregory I, Gregory VII. And you'll see how, between their two examples, the papacy evolved from being kind of, like, not as powerful to a lot more powerful. And so enjoy the reading for the week. Um, let me know if you have questions, but definitely pick a topic and start figuring, doing research on that so you can make your outline that's due next week. Thank you.